Welcome everyone to a Dolphin Communication Project Deep Dive. Um, today we are joined by Dr. Nicole, uh, one of our core DCP team members, and she's going to chat with us about the partial merger of two dolphin societies. Um, this was a chapter in her PhD dissertation. Uh, a lot of work, a lot of hours um, went into it, um, and I'm very excited for you all to hear. Um, if you're listening to the recording, we hope that you enjoy it, and if you're listening live, please submit your questions um, to the chat. And with that, I will stop my screen share and pass it over to Nicole. And meanwhile, I will um, welcome some of our latecomers. All right, thank you, Cal. Let me just get situated. Like Cal said, we are a little rusty, so just let me get used to my little Zoom thing. Okay, so as Kel said, I'll be talking about one of my chapters, which was published recently in August, um, called The Partial Merger of Dolphin Societies, which garnered a lot of attention in the press. Um, I gave interviews to the New York Times, Science Magazine, Newsweek, but obviously this was interesting to me, but why was it so interesting to the public? Um, well, if you'll notice, most of the titles have the words, have some word that indicates peace. Peace and love, not war. Swimmingly suggests things went well. Um, rare that they used in Newsweek, though I wouldn't have used the word alliance. So we're gonna talk about why it's so interesting. So for most terrestrial mammals, encounters between groups are aggressive. This is almost always the case for chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, and a lot of other primate species, but we do see it in animals closer to home. So if you think about introducing dogs, you when you get a new dog, you're asked to bring your old dog or your existing dog outside to meet out of the house. Um, if you have pack dogs, you know, on the street, if there's two packs, they're gonna fight. So why might terrestrial species have this tendency to be aggressive towards strangers? Well, there's a few reasons. On land, you have the ability to defend resources. So whether that be a watering hole, food that grows on trees or grass, um, it allows you to form a territory which can then be defended. There's also less phylopatry in terrestrial mammals. Phylopatry is the tendency to stay in your natal area or group, so the place where you were born or in the group with which you were born. Um, so for a lot of species females will stay in the natal group and males will disperse. This is actually reversed in great apes. Uh, males will stay and females will disperse. But either way, you don't really have a lot of individuals that already know each other staying in the same place. And also the cost of locomotion on land. So terrestrial animals have to deal with gravity, obviously. So it doesn't allow them to travel as far. It means that they have smaller territories that won't overlap or are less likely to overlap with those of others and you're more able to defend them against others. Are there any exceptions though in terrestrial species? Yes, this is a picture of some bonobos. They are a peaceful species. In the literature, there are a lot of examples of tolerant or affili affiliative encounters observed between bonobo groups, but these are temporary. They last a few days, maybe a couple of months. They usually go back to their original group. And this is attributed to the dominant role, the piece is attributed to the dominant role of females in bonobo society, as opposed to chimpanzees and gorillas where males are dominant. However, in chimpanzees we have seen peaceful group interactions if there are no adults in the group or if there are no adults at all. So a group of juveniles might be welcomed into a group of chimpanzees more readily than if they had adults with them. But what about aquatic species? So we already know that dolphins violate a lot of terrestrial norms. Firstly, a lot of species have bisexual phylopatry in which both males and females will stay in the natal area or group. Geographic phylopatry is when they stay in the same area where they were born. Social phylopatry is when they stay in their same social group in which they were born. And this is attributed to the low cost of locomotion. You don't have to go very far to find mates. Um, also, ranges are a lot bigger, so it's harder to get out of your group, 
where you can get away from individuals with whom you're related, but still be part of the same social group. And this also makes living in the water makes it difficult to defend resources. They don't have one patch of grass that they can defend against others. Their food is always in flux. Um, yes, so what about intergroup encounters? Well, we do have one example in the literature before ours for long-beaked spinner dolphins on Midway Atoll. And just to orient you a little, these are the Hawaiian Islands. And way out here is Midway Atoll. All of this flattish stuff is very deep water. So if we zoom in on the atoll, you can see this really dark stuff is deep, deep water. And there's not a whole lot of shallow around it where the dolphins can rest and uh, be a little safer from predators. So they actually do have a resource that they can defend. Their safe resting bays are something that they're going to defend against strange groups. So in the early 2000s, researchers observed 60 immigrant dolphins joining a group of about 130 resident spinner dolphins, and they saw very low association between groups. They mostly spent time in their resident and immigrant groups. When there was interaction, it was typically aggressive, and it usually involved the residents chasing the immigrants out of their resting base. But in the literature, they were only studied for a year, so we don't really know what happened afterwards. Personal communication with the lead author tells us that they did integrate a little bit more after, but we don't know to what extent. So that leads me to our study. I'm sure many of you are familiar with our study site. Bimini, the Bahamas. This is the Great Bahama Bank. Bimini lies on the westernmost edge, directly adjacent to this really deep water of the Gulf Stream. We're about 50 miles east of Miami. And we've been studying the spotted dolphins here since 2003. But what happened in 2013? Well, I remember it fairly vividly. I was on the bow, Kel was up in the bridge, taking notes, and I was trying to identify the dolphins that were in front of me. I couldn't recognize anyone. And yes, it was my first year. I was an intern, but it was very unusual to feel like these dolphins are strangers. Not just, I don't know who that dolphin is, but that dolphin looks different than what I'm used to. So it turned out it was a nearly 50 unfamiliar dolphins that we ended up taking photos of in that year and a few years later, that over time, we were able to use citizen scientists to confirm that they came from an area called the White Sand Ridge. So the White Sand Ridge is up here. It lies on the Little Bahama Bank. You'll notice that the Little Bahama Bank is similar to the Great Bahama Bank, shallow water directly adjacent to the Gulf Stream. And it's about 160 kilometers north of the northernmost part of the Great Bahama Bank. Scientists have been studying the spotted dolphins there for about 30 years, and they have no evidence of big immigration events either. They have lost groups of dolphins, presumably to hurricanes, and they've had other population fluctuations, but they've never had a group of 50 arrive like this. And it makes sense, even though they're relatively close, 100 miles when you're a dolphin is not that far, but they'd have to cross this really deep channel, which would mean that they'd have to be exposed to predators. And they can't go directly south. They This island kind of blocks the way, so they'd have to go all the way around, meaning that they'd be in deep water for longer. So it makes sense that they have not mixed before. But why have they mixed now? So we'll get into that in a minute, but we're going to briefly review our methodology. I say it's brief, so if you'd like to learn more, you can check out our past webinars, including our spotted dolphin friendships, pectoral fin contacts, social bonds, and social network analysis. Naturally, our first step is to collect data. So how does DCP collect data? Around Bimini, we collect surface and underwater observations. So we, from the boat, we count the number of dolphins, see generally what activity they're doing, if there are subgroups, if there are multiple species, and such. Underwater, we collect video data using our custom-built mobile video acoustic system, or MVA and we collect still photos using underwater cameras. And then we use those photos to identify who was there. 
Spotted dolphins very conveniently are born without spots and gain them as they age. So we're able to broadly classify them into these five age classes and use that at least as a baseline for who we're looking at. Then we're able to confirm sex if we get a good shot of the belly. So males on the left here have this exclamation point and females have kind of a division symbol. And then if we get good enough video or photos, we're able to identify the individuals. Spotted dolphins have unique spot patterns and they also have permanent injuries or scars like Prince William here on his peduncle. We can use those to identify them from one year to the next. Once we know who was there, what do we do with that? So for this study specifically, first we looked at association or time spent in the same group. So typically for cetacean studies, studies of cryptic animals that live in trees or where you can't watch them all the time, it's hard to confirm when they interact. So instead we use association as a proxy. If we see them in the same group, we assume that they're gonna interact at some point. To quantify this, we use coefficients of association or COAs, which are an estimate of the proportion of time that they are together versus apart. Like I said, we can go into more detail in other webinars, but we can use these quantified COAs to create a visual sociogram where the little circles indicate the individual, in this case individual dolphins, and the lines between them would indicate the relative strength of their bond. So thicker lines would be stronger bonds. Um, and then we can see things about the social network like this individual is separate, isn't connected to anybody, and then there are some individuals that have a lot of connections. So sociograms are a simple way of looking at the broader social structure. To learn more about this, you can look at our Spotted Dolphin Friendship Deep Dive or the Social Network Analysis Deep Dive. So what do these COAs tell us? Well, naturally they tell us which dolphins spend time together and how much time they spend together. As I said, it is a proportion of the amount of time that we see each individual that they are together. So if a pair has a COA of say 0.9, that means that they, we saw them together 90% of the time. 90% of the time that we saw one of them, it was with the other. Versus a COA of 0.1 would indicate only 10% of the time. So then what else were we looking at in this study? Well, we know that tactile behaviors help establish and maintain social bonds in group living species and they can play different roles. This might be preening for ravens or birds, grooming in primates, head rubbing in lions, and in dolphins, it is a lot of pectoral fin contact and other underwater body contact. So to figure out how um, the White Sand Ridge dolphins impacted this, we event sampled our video data for physical contact. And that just means we watched our video and we logged every time one dolphin's body came into contact with another. If we are able to figure out who initiated and who received, we log that, their age, sex, and ID if it's known, body parts, and other details about that specific contact. To learn more about this, you can check out our social bonds and pectoral fin contact deep dives. But to see an example of this, this is a video of two juvenile female dolphins. You'll see that we would have logged that as two separate contacts we would log this, and then once it goes out of view, we would stop because we don't know for sure that they're touching. We would log this, silly little behavior. And we would watch all of the video that we took that day and do the exact same thing. It also allows us to understand the context of what's happening and the reaction. So when the top dolphin will play it again, initiated her con or the bottom dolphin initiated her contact the other one did not leave and in fact kind of indicated more that she would like more contact and then they started this pectoral fin rubbing so that would be a positive response to an affiliative contact sometimes we get neutral responses where the dolphin doesn't react at all sometimes we get negative responses where it swims away and using this video, you can see that how this type of exchange would help them develop trust. And if they continue to interact this way, as they get older, it would strengthen their bond. So as 
if they're older and they have their first calf, they might reach out to each other to support them in that new stage of life. So now that we have our IDs, we have our COAs, we have our underwater interactions, we can start asking our questions about our specific scenario. So just a reminder, we're talking about these white sand ridge dolphins that joined the Bimini group. It was almost 50 dolphins. And we do know some things about them. They have been studied for a long time. They have a similar social structure to the Bimini dolphins. They have long-term preferential partnerships, meaning that they select the same individuals repeatedly to spend time with. And they have a preference for same-sex, similar-aged associates, just like the Bimini dolphins do. They also have uh, long-term site fidelity and geographic and social phylopetry. So dolphins that are born there will stay there and they'll stay in their same social group. They also have a similar habitat, as I was mentioning, so they can rest and socialize in the shallow area, zip into the deep water to feed overnight, which is what we think the Bimini dolphins do. And they haven't seen any large scale immigration events, just like on Bimini. I meant to change this, but here we go. So one question we can ask is why? Why would they move if they have everything that they need up north? Why would they move? We can also look at the impact on the associations in the existing group. We don't have the background for the White Sand Ridge Dolphins, but we do know what the association and social structure looked like for the Bimini Dolphins before the White Sand Ridge Dolphins came. So we might think if a huge group of new dolphins came, maybe I would want to be friends with one of them because it's bigger or, you know, a little older, know something that my friends don't. Maybe my friendships would weaken because I would be spending more time investing in a new friendship. Conversely, my friendships might get stronger because I don't want those other individuals near me. So we, we are interested in what happened to the associations between Bimini dolphins. We might also expect aggression. Terrestrial species will aggress at each other when two groups come together. This might be aggression towards these strangers, but it also might be displaced aggression towards each other. So you'll see that a lot in cats. If two groups will come together and individuals are upset about it, they might aggress towards individuals that they actually like and spend time with. So what impact did it have on the Bimini dolphins? And then also we're curious about the displacement. Did Is there some kind of carrying capacity for this area? There's about 120 Bimini dolphins that are resident to the area. Does the addition of 50 new dolphins mean that all 170 can stay? Do the 50 new ones displace 50 Bimini dolphins? We're not, we weren't really sure. So to answer the first question, why did the White Sand Ridge dolphins move? We're not really sure, but some possibilities would be a shift in predation in their normal area. If all of a sudden there were a bunch more tiger sharks that were predating on the dolphins or they moved into an area where the dolphins used to be able to rest and now they can't, maybe that meant that there was less safe area for all of them and one group moved south. We don't really have any evidence for that. So what else could be possible? It might have been a shift in their prey distribution. Maybe there isn't enough space for everybody, not enough food, even though they go in the deep water to forage, maybe something happened and the productive water moved south. So a different study looked at the chlorophyll levels on the surface of the water, which is an indication of the productivity, which then with more productivity, you can assume that there's gonna be more foraging fish for the dolphins. They found some evidence for shifts. It's not quite enough to convince me that this is the reason for the move. Also, it might have been a shift in the social dynamics of the spotted dolphins on the White Sand Ridge. The dolphins up there have clusters. There's a northern cluster, a central cluster, and a southern cluster, and the entire southern cluster moved south. So that suggests that maybe it was more about social dynamics, but we don't have any evidence in either direction. So our first question, the truth is we're not sure what the answer to it is. Uh, we can't go back in time to see what might have happened around that time. Um, but again, it was notable that it's an entire social cluster that moved. Maybe that means it's less likely to be environmental. We don't know. But what were our results for the Bimini dolphins? 
In group behavior broadly, we saw an increase of mixed origin groups, meaning feminine white sand ridge dolphins in the same group from 2013 to 2018. It did not continue increasing, but you can see that in uh, along the x-axis, you'll see the year with the number of surveys or boat trips that we took in parentheses. And then along the y is the proportion of the surveys that we saw that we conducted that year that were of each type. So the red is bimini only groups, the white is white sand ridge only, and the blue are mixed groups. In 2013, we only saw one mixed group, and it was one white sand ridge dolphin with bimini dolphins. The change from 2013 to 2014 was statistically significant, for sure, and that's remarkable because that was less than a year between when we first started seeing white sand ridge dolphins to when we started seeing them with bimini dolphins a lot. So not only did they integrate, but they did it very quickly. And then what about the COAs? So ignore the figure for just a moment. Average COA overall between bimini and white sand ridge dolphins was significantly lower than for bimini, bimini pairs. But if we can look at these figures along the x-axis, we have the type of pair. So either two bimini dolphins, a bimini and a white sand ridge, or two white sand ridge dolphins. This is a box plot, but more interesting are the dots. Each dot is the specific COA value for a pair. And along the y-axis is the COA. So you can see for males, there were mixed origin male pairs that approached the strongest bonds that we saw between bimini dolphins. And these bonds, these strong ones, are adults, which is astounding. Um, there's evidence that dolphins will form their bonds uh, when they're younger and then strengthen them as they get older to the point where they are in other populations considered alliances where the dolphins will collaborate potentially at their own detriment to, um, to work together. But these were adults that only spent at most six years together, but this, these strong COAs happened before the end of our study. So how is that possible? This is not the case for female dyads, although we didn't see a huge number of white sand ridge females. Um, but even the strongest bimini white sand ridge female dyad didn't come very close to the strongest bimini female dyads. And this was two juvenile females. They tend to have, juveniles tend to have slightly more flexible social behaviors. They're more tolerant of each other. And interestingly, the male female dyads were similar to the male dyads, where it between bimini dolphins was similar to what we saw between bimini and white sand ridge dolphins, meaning that females interacted with white sand ridge males as much as they interacted with bimini males. Now looking at our sociogram, again, don't get overwhelmed. So this is our overall network, and it only includes pairs that had a COA over 0.13, which was the mean association rate between white sand ridge dolphins. Yellow indicates female, blue indicates male, squares are white sand ridge dolphins, and circles are bimini dolphins. This was plotted using multidimensional scaling, which would plots individuals that are more strongly associated and have more strong associations closer to the center. So you can kind of visualize who's the social butterfly. So first you'll notice the female dolphins stayed on the periphery of the social network, and a lot of their connections were with white sand ridge males. But we do see a little group of white sand ridge males that integrated into the bimini dolphin group. And even these males, they have strong bonds across this cluster, um, but they did tend to interact or spend time with each other more than they did with bimini dolphins. Um, but you can see these dark lines do indicate strong associations between them. Now looking at another scary figure, these are all the sociograms for the different combinations, sorry, of sexes. So we have just Bimini and White Sand Ridge females here. You can see that the White Sand Ridge females barely interacted with any Bimini females. By contrast, the White Sand Ridge males did interact more with the Bimini females. This was plotted similarly to the previous figure where more central means that they have stronger bonds and they have more strong bonds. So we can see that the 
Too many females and white sand ridge males integrated a little bit more. But the interesting thing is here, the Bimini and white sand ridge males, where you see lots of overlap. There's lots of squares in the center with these circles. So the Bimini males definitely allowed the white sand ridge males to integrate into their social group. But what about their underwater contacts? Dolphins from both groups initiated affiliative contact with each other. So affiliative contacts are those positive contacts like the females pectoral fin rubbing against each other. And individuals in both groups initiated that type of contact, which is remarkable because not only did we not see overt aggression, we saw a lot of positive contact, which is very unusual in terrestrial intergroup encounters. We also saw that most of the contacts between Bimini and White Sand Ridge Dolphins elicited a positive or neutral response. So as I was saying earlier, positive would be if the dolphin, the receiver continued the positive contact, neutral would be if they just kind of didn't do anything, and negative would be if they left. We only saw 11 negative responses and none of those were overt aggression. It was mostly a male who was trying to mate with a female. But this is also an example of what an agonistic exchange would look like. So you'll see some drawing, a little bit of like twitching with the tail, faster movements, head butting, like that. Some more drawing. But that doesn't look like aggression to me. The dolphins were coming back to initiate more contact. We can watch it again. They interacted with each other and then swam around and came back underneath to initiate more contact. So that does not suggest that it's aggression. And then affiliative contact looks a little like this. This is a group of Bimini and White Sand Ridge males primarily. And you'll see lots of pectoral fin contact, slow swimming in a group close to each other, swimming in a mother calf position which is what you would do if you were very trusting of your group mate. You can watch that one again too. So this was the majority of what we saw underwater, which is just very unusual. And the fact that they're mostly subadult or adult males. So under what circumstances would we see non-aggressive group mergers? When they're observed on land, which they are occasionally, it's due to some external stressor. So either there's a major shift in their habitat or there's habitat loss and they're forced together and they have nowhere else to go. So they have to be okay with sharing the same space. Um, sometimes they share the same space and don't even interact. So that's a non-aggressive group merger, but they don't interact affiliatively either. Um, sometimes groups come together because of an increase in predation, so it's beneficial to all group members to be in a bigger group, so it doesn't matter as much that that's a stranger. And like I was saying before, because of a loss of adults, sometimes chimpanzee groups or other primate groups will lose the adults in the group and the juveniles will be forced to find other adults to be with. The adults in a new group aren't as threatened by the new juveniles, so they allow them to join the group. But that's on land. Why do we think that this happened with um, the dolphins that we were looking at? Well, again, we're not positive, but one reason might be the lack of competition for resources. So again, Bimini lies on this big shallow bank and all along this edge, they have access to the deep water. So they're not limited by the amount of sheltered resting area and they're not limited with their access to deep water. So they're not competing over shelter or resources. There also might be cooperative benefits to members of both groups if they cooperate and allow each other to merge peacefully. So this could be against predators, which again, in the deep water when they're foraging, they have, they're more likely to encounter sharks. So maybe it's, but the benefit of having a bigger group. And if you're gonna go into the deep water, you wanna make sure that you trust the dolphins that you're with. So when you're in the shallow water, you're allowing them to come closer to have 
positive contact with you so that when you go in the deep water, you know that that guy's gonna have your back. Or also for foraging, we think that they forage on schooling fish. It might be beneficial to have multiple group members. And again, if you have established strong bonds when you're in the shallow water, you're gonna have those bonds to support you when you're foraging in the deep water. Another possibility is that there are sufficient mating opportunities in this case. There are a small number of what are considered old bimini males, over 20 years old. Um, and the, BIM, the White Sand Ridge group included young adult and adult males and females. So there, it wasn't just a group of adult male White Sand Ridge dolphins joining the bimini dolphins, which maybe would have meant that they would have to compete for the females. And the White Sand Ridge group didn't just have adults, it also had calves, juveniles. So maybe the fact that it was a full social group made it easier for them to all merge together. So what's the gist of all of that information? We have the fast evolution of tolerance between these groups, possibly due to a lack of resource competition, which encompasses food, space, for resting mates. And in summary, we saw that the dolphin groups integrated within a year, which is remarkable. The fact that they integrated at all is remarkable, and the fact that they did it so quickly is even more so. We saw that Bimini and White Sand Ridge dolphins formed strong bonds that approached the strength of Bimini bonds between two Bimini dolphins. And we saw them exchange affiliative tactile contact and no overt aggression. All of this is very unexpected given what we have seen in terrestrial species. And notably, we still see mixed groups and affiliative contact when we go out on the boat with ecotours, noting that we have not collected data since the end of the 2019 field season, but we are able to identify them while we're on the boat um, just by sight. So we know that they're still mixing together, which is crazy. So this is why all of those newspapers thought that this was such an interesting topic. And with that, I will take questions. Well, with that, I'll let Kel take over. Thank you. Um, feel free to dump more questions in the chat. Um, I'm just going to do our little wrap up first, and then we will get to those questions. Um, so if my thing will cooperate, um, if you are new to these DCP webinars, um, you can find the recordings on our YouTube channel. You can also find them directly on our new and improved website. Just look under that knowledge hub and you will find webinars. And if you've watched this one, other ones, you need more content. Um, our Dolphin Pod is available wherever you get your um, podcasts. And this was a DCP deep dive, so a little more technical, but hopefully still accessible. Um, we also have Dolphin Lessons, which are geared toward elementary students, but I like to think they're also for the young at heart. Um, so again, all of those are on our website and our YouTube channel. And if you're listening live, we have breaking news. Um, if you know our director, uh, Kathleen Dudzinski, um, she was recently a part of a podcast, No Such Word as Can't, um, which is hosted by Hazel McBride. Um, so that just went live today, if you want to go check it out. And we also have a new publication that just came out today um, on the shoreline distribution of dolphins along um, the coast of Bimini. Um, so that's looking at both the spotted and the bottlenose dolphins. And we will hopefully do a webinar on that in the coming weeks. And of course, um, we are a nonprofit, so we would be a bad nonprofit if we didn't remind you how you can support us. Um, we are happy to provide these education programs at no cost, so they are accessible to all. But of course, we appreciate your support through memberships, donations, when we do a t-shirt campaign, um, join us in the field. If you shop on Amazon, Honestly, even if you don't choose DCP, just make sure you're choosing some charity um, and let Amazon help support nonprofits around the world. And if you're looking for eco-conscious reef, actually reef safe um, sunscreen and other 
uh, body products, check out stream to see. And if you use our coupon code, they will make a donation to DCP at no extra cost to you. And of course, just stay in touch. Um, use our website, use our information, share our posts, spread the word. Um, we know that we can't protect dolphins if we don't learn more about them. Um, and sneaky, sneaky, if we protect dolphins, we have to protect the entire ocean. Um, so with that, we will get to some questions. Um, we will take Aloysius's question first. Let's see. Um, data are limited, <laughs> always the case, Al. Um, how many dolphins do you think stayed at White, at White Sand Ridge? So what percentage of the population does the 50 uh, migrants represent? Thanks, Al. Hi, nice to see you. Can't wait to see you in person soon. Um, it's a good question. I can't hear Nicole. Can other oh. people hear her? Is that a me issue? You try again, Nicole. Oh, Al says he can hear me. Um, and oh, Al can hear you. So you just go ahead, Nicole. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Al. Um, so we don't study the dolphins on the White Sand Ridge, but at last count, I think they got up to about 80 of their original dolphins that were still there, not counting the 50 that left. So the 50 is about 40% of the population that was up there. Um, so it's a significant chunk. Good question. Mm -hmm. And um, I did miss part of that. Um, so hopefully I'm not uh, repeating something you just said, but you also mentioned that on White Sand Ridge, there were clusters. Um, is that what you said just now? Yes. Um, oh, no, I didn't. Did, did the other clusters stay? Yes. So the northern and southern clusters were particularly large. And so the southern cluster all moved. And I think maybe a couple of the central cluster dolphins, there's a very small number in the central, but the entire northern cluster stayed. And Thank I don't you. think it's, from my understanding of their publications from White Sand Ridge, it's not northern, like they only stay in the very north part of the Little Bahama Bank. Central, they only stay here in southern. It's just they tend to cluster in that way, but they all interact with each other. Thank you. Um, Malcolm is commenting that um, the general public often tends to think that all dolphins do this thing or all dolphins behave this way. Um, do you find that dolphin behavior is more varied than that? Just the way humans are as well? Yes, absolutely. And that's a very important thing to note um, because dolphins, most species will live in a broad range. So Atlantic spotted dolphins live throughout the Atlantic temperate areas, not just around the Bahamas. So their habitats are gonna be very different. This prey that they can feed on is going to be different. So their behaviors are naturally going to be different. Um, however, they do also kind of like humans have broad tendencies. So we can guess that a delphinid with a similar environment and social structure would also be able to integrate like this. So porpoises don't have as much socialization between them. Maybe it wouldn't happen with them. Maybe they would interact the way that terrestrial species do, but maybe a group of bottlenose dolphins off of the coast of the U.S. would be able to do it. We just haven't published about it. Yeah, and I find I'm always reminding people that, you know, if you read a story about a dolphin that did thing A or even dolphin group that did thing A, well, what species was it? What part of the world was it? Um, because it doesn't mean that all dolphins are going to behave that way. So thank you, Malcolm. And they probably could do that thing. So there are a lot of uh, bottlenose populations where individuals have specialized foraging techniques that you don't see anywhere else in the world, but dolphins everywhere else in the world don't have that environment, so they don't have to learn it. But if you were to take one of those dolphins and put it there, it probably could learn it if it had to. So 
just like people. Like I speak English, I live here and I grew up here, have my customs, but if you put me in France, then I would speak French and have whatever other customs. So um, yes, I, I like that yeah. comment slash question. I agree. Um, Kevin is noting that the White Sand Ridge Dolphins moved in a big group with males and females. And then when they arrived, your COA diagrams showed the males integrating more and the females remaining more separate. Do you know why the females didn't integrate as, he said easily, but maybe we could say as obviously or as to the extent that the males did? A great question too. So the as you see in the map, the area is very big. So we suspect because we didn't see a ton of white sand ridge females generally and as regularly, I guess we did see them. They just weren't there as often. We think that they were using a different area. So we know that our bimini dolphins that we've been studying move we just happen to find them in this area regularly around the same time of day so we know where to go looking. So we don't have to go farther in any direction to find them, but it's very likely that they are there. So for whatever reason, the female white sand ridge dolphins weren't in the area where we were looking at that time. I suspect that they do mix in other places and similarly will be more tolerant of each other, but maybe we need uh, some boat trips so we can confirm that. Yes. We need um, research permits in the Bahamas to get sorted out so we can resume and do more. Um, this next question I suspect is either from someone who uh, knows Bimini or knows uh, our research well. Um, do you know at all how the White Sand Ridge immigrants interacted with the bottlenose dolphins in the area? That's a really good question. And I did not look at that, obviously, because I didn't talk about it at all. I don't know that I even have an anecdote about it. Do you, Kel? Mm -hmm. My only anecdote is that it seemed, I'm not tying it to the immigration, but I feel like if we go back in our data, we're going to find fewer mixed species groups um, in recent years. Um, but I wouldn't apply a reason to that. Um, the thing about the mixed species groups in Bimini is that they are not rare, but they are not common. So if you have a season with, you know, only one or two, it just might be that they were mixing on the day you weren't out on the boat kind of thing. Um, but yeah, something to, to look into a bit more. Um, another question you referenced, um, the hypothesis in the literature about chlorophyll levels um, on the Little Bahama Bank kind of being an indicator that maybe there's an issue in the food chain. Um, do you know if anyone has asked questions about human fishing in the area and whether or not our overfishing is an issue for the dolphins in this region? Interesting question. No. I don't. I don't know of anybody who's looked at that. It would be interesting to look at. However, I don't know that, do we fish a lot in the Gulf Stream? And it's always like fast, deep water. So I don't know how much that would impact the dolphins. It's a good yeah. question. And off, off the top of my head, I don't think we're fishing for the same species. Um, yeah. So it would be like a broader food web, you know, with what's the, I'm not implying that. <laughs> humans overfishing isn't an issue. Um, I'm just not sure it's the direct issue for this case. Yes. Um, and then there's one more question that I can't um, scroll to. So I'm gonna stop my share for a second since we're working toward the end and see if that fixes my glitch. Um, Oh, here's the last question I was trying to find. Um, do you know of any offspring that have a bottlenose and a white sand ridge parent? Bimini and white sand ridge. A bimini and white sand ridge parent. Sorry, <laughs> I, was like, I don't even I don't know, know what I said. <laughs> um, 
unfortunately, we don't have paternity yet, but we have seen females of both groups have calves, a lot of them, since the White Sand Ridge dolphins came. And we have seen White Sand Ridge males with bimini females in groups where there was mating happening. So chances are, yes, but we have to, well, get a research permit first, but then also do mm -hmm. our genetic testing, which hopefully one day maybe we'll get. Yeah. Um, and I think we have a, a little more time. Um, Alo is finding that this is just fascinating. Um, have any White Sand Ridge immigrants gone home? Have you heard from the White Sand Ridge group about that? I have not. I haven't either, but there yeah, are in any specificity anyway. There are some, especially older but not so old that maybe they passed away, um, that we stopped seeing. We saw them in 2013 and maybe like once in 2014 and then no more. Um, also, we'll see some, or we did see some early in the study period and then didn't see them for a while and saw them again. So I would not be surprised if some of them permanently moved back and if others are kind mm -hmm. of moving around on the little Bahama bank. Mm -hmm. um, we, I assume that the White Sand Ridge researchers um, were interested in that too, and hopefully they'll publish about it soon. Yes, and I think uh, kind of a concluding conversation is we talk about the dolphins on the White Sand Ridge, and we talk about the dolphins of Bimini, and we talk about them as if they have these firm boundaries in in where they go and that those are the only two groups of spotted dolphins in all of the Bahamas. But that's not true. Um, there are dolphins south of Bimini, um, a spotted dolphins specifically south of Bimini. There are spotted dolphins west of Bimini. Um, so there's just a lot of ocean. There's a lot of area where we are not looking um, because we only have so much funding and so much time and things like that. Um, so there is more observations to be made, um, more science to be done, and uh, hopefully the world will be supportive of that so that we can keep um, learning more. If anyone isn't familiar with the story of 104, the spotted dolphin who stranded, uh, was rescued, rehabbed, and he's the only tagged um, spotted dolphin in the region. Um, it's not tagged anymore. It was a short-term tag. Um, he went farther and faster than anyone thought a spotted dolphin could or would go. Um, and he went to an area that was being explored for oil. Um, so I think there's some real value in asking these questions about where are the dolphins moving? Uh, what it, what is their range? How far are they going? Even if it's not a space they use as their home spot, you know, where, where are they going? Uh, what areas do we need to make sure that we're protecting for them? So there's our conservation plug. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, with that, um, I'd like to thank all of our live listeners and a big thank you to Dr. Nicole for sharing this work with us. Um, hopefully it was the in-between, between the short popular press summaries with catchy uh, headlines and the kind of denser uh, publication, but the publication is open access, so everyone can read it. Um, if you have a hard time finding it, just um, shoot us an email and we'll make sure you get a copy. And until next time. <laughs>